Welcome to the lecture on endocrine system in unit 16 in the laboratory manual uh, for anatomy and physiology to students. Now, in the endocrine system, we're essentially talking about the glands and other organs throughout the body that release small messengers called hormones. These are molecules released from one cell, go to the bloodstream, travel at a long distance usually to some other target tissue to have their effect. So there are many different types of hormones, some made of proteins, some are uh, cholesterol based, some based on other chemicals, other molecules. Uh, and we want to go over the names of all of these structures, where they're located, which kind of hormones are actually produced and secreted by these glands. And the way we're gonna do this is that first we wanna talk about primary endocrine glands, those whose function ideally is primarily to secrete hormones. That's what the organs are there for. Um, and then some secondary endocrine glands or tissues as well. Now, <clears throat> all of these structures, make sure to see in the book, the illustrations where the actual anatomical location physically in the body, where these glands are. And so, like I said, We'll go through each of them. We'll try to go kind of from a top-down approach. Uh, multiple important endocrine areas are located in the brain uh, or directly sort of connected to the brain. And others are dispersed throughout the body. Um, now, again, to keep track of them, make sure you're looking at the pictures of the diagrams in the book to follow along uh, with the notes and the videos. So. The most important uh, structure in the endocrine system starts with the one that's connected to the managing center of everything, which obviously is the brain. Remember, the brain is in charge of all functions in the body, ultimately has the final say in terms of which organ and which structure can do what in the body. And so it's no surprise that the hypothalamus, which is uh, the small structure above the pituitary gland, deep in the brain, would be involved in the primary endocrine response and essentially in charge of other endocrine organs in the body. Now, the best way to characterize the hypothalamus is to say, uh, from one perspective, it does actually have two um, hormones that it synthesizes that actually will go down as a posterior to pituitary will be released there. And uh, the even more important function of the hypothalamus is that it actually has multiple centers there inside the structure that release either inhibitory or releasing hormones. And they go by different names, by abbreviations, as you'll see in the book. But essentially, these are a set of chemicals that are sort of in charge of other hormones in the body. So if they need to inhibit an activity, they'll be released to say, stop secreting uh, certain hormones to a certain gland. Or if they're releasing hormones, they will say, go ahead and release more. That's basically what that is in summary for the very specific two hormones secreted and kind of synthesized in the hypothalamus. These are oxytocin and vasopressin. Now, uh, just to uh, tell you in advance, for each of the hormones we'll be talking about, because this is a very large topic, I cannot go into all the details for each of the hormones. We'll just briefly outline the main kind of functions associated with one, so you are responsible only for those functions that I actually mentioned in class and of course, you're welcome to learn more about them in the book and using your own sources. Uh, now, oxytocin, the first hormone that we're studying here, this is the one, again, released by the hypothalamus and then will go to the posterior pituitary and we actually uh, release into the bloodstream from there. Oxytocin has multiple functions in the body and we're actually still in the process of learning more and more about it. But one main function that we want to talk about here is that it helps with uterine contractions during the last stages of uh, labor when the woman is giving birth. So it's the process of contractions to release the baby. How does that happen? Basically, oxytocin will be released by the posterior pituitary, goes to the uterine muscles, the smooth muscle there, remember that's involuntary, and those contractions will speed up the essentially expulsion of the fetus from the body, right? During last stages of labor. Uh, vasopressin, another hormone here in the hypothalamus, this is a hormone also called antidiuretic hormone or ADH. Um, 
and this is the hormone that acts on the kidney, specifically the collecting ducts and the nephron, and there are receptors there for ADH to allow for water retention. So basically, remember the kidneys are able to either release more water or keep more water in the body, right? This is how they regulate water balance. So one of the primary ways this is done is through this hormone, vasopressin, again, that will be released from the posterior pituitary, will go to the collecting ducts of the kidney, and when, in, when activated, will allow more water retention to take place there. Uh, now, the next structure right below the hypothalamus is the pituitary. Pituitary is this very small structure kind of hanging off of a stalk uh, from the brain. It's protected by the sphenoid bone in the skull. Now, there's two parts of the pituitary, the anterior and the posterior pituitary. Uh, now, posterior, we just talked about, that is the one that releases those two previous hormones. Anterior pituitary is much more important. It releases essentially at least six different hormones that are abbreviated here. Uh, so again, even though this is a very, very tiny area, when you see it under a microscope, when you see it in images histologically, you will see it has different color, different kind of staining cells, different appearances that actually are responsible for synthesizing and secreting into the bloodstream multiple hormones that deal with multiple different variety of controls over the body. So we have TSH, which stands for thyroid stimulating hormone. We have GH, which stands for growth hormone. We have prolactin, which is a, a hormone that deals with uh, mammary glands, the breast tissue in the female. We have the ACTH, which is the adrenocorticotropic hormone. We have the LH, which is the luteinizing hormone. And we have the FSH, which is the follicle stimulating hormone. LH and FSH deal with only reproductive system functions primarily. Uh, ACTH deals with the adrenal gland, TSH, deals with the thyroid obviously, and the growth hormone has effects throughout the whole body. Now we're gonna talk about the thyroid soon, but essentially in order to tell the thyroid what to do, the TSH needs to be released first, and that says basically to stimulate the normal production of the thyroid hormones, and this happens uh, once this hormone is released, right? Again, so we do not want our glands on their own to decide what to do. They rely on the brain, they rely on the pituitary and the hypothalamus basically for these functions. So when the thyroid needs to function, needs to release its hormones, the TSH must be released first to go to the thyroid and then the thyroid does its job. Always, by the way, abbreviate these names just like I'm doing here in endocrine system because we have so many new terms here uh, and many new names of these hormones, messengers. It's very appropriate to uh, very useful to abbreviate them always. Again, as long as the abbreviation is used and acceptable, it's fine to use it on an exam or in homework or anywhere else. Uh, <clears throat> so very often, we're going to keep in mind what is the target tissue. So for instance, for TSH, the target tissue is just the thyroid. For growth hormone, on the other hand, all the cells in the body have uh, receptors for the growth hormone. And so that is essentially there, right? To make us grow, to allow for normal protein synthesis, normal uh, cellular functions in the body, which all cells need to do, right? Remember, every cell in the body is alive, needs to have organelles, needs to have proper protein synthesis information of other molecules. Normal functioning cells all require growth hormone throughout a person's life. So growth hormone is not only there when you're actually growing, when you're getting bigger, but actually supports normal development, normal structure, normal function of the body throughout a person's life, okay? Uh, we will talk about uh, separately, <clears throat> what kind of abnormalities can occur uh, in case of a growth hormone? Uh, so for instance, uh, a growth hormone could be released in excess, causing two separate conditions. Uh, one is what's called gigantism, and another is called acromegaly. So gigantism is when the growth hormone is released before the growth plates close, so a child that's, let's say, five-year-old would receive uh, excessive growth hormone secretion because of some abnormalities and would grow to be abnormally tall and very large. And if the growth plates have already fused, let's say someone who's like 25 years old, but is somehow getting extra growth hormone secretions, they will result in acromegaly state, which is when basically uh, <clears throat> their gloves don't fit anymore, their hats don't fit, right? They have changes in facial expression, 
changes in bone structure. Again, they might not be getting taller necessarily, but they still have significant uh, appearance changes due to this excess growth hormone secretions and possibly organ damage as well. Again, both of these conditions are not common, uh, but keep in mind that they are a result of this endocrine abnormality. Now for prolactin, prolactin we're essentially thinking about stimulation of milk production in the mammary glands in the female, which happens during the later stages of pregnancy, just before the woman is ready to give birth. And obviously the, the newborn will be reliant on the breast milk. And so in order for the milk to be produced, prolactin is the hormone that must be involved here, must be secreted again, coming from the anterior pituitary. <clears throat> Now for ACTH or adrenocorticotropin hormone, we are talking about here the adrenal gland, which are these, if you remember, triangular structures on top of the kidneys, which we saw in class. Uh, in order to tell the adrenal gland what to do or the fact to start functioning, ACTH must be released here, and it goes to the adrenal, which we'll talk about soon, and kind of activates that organ appropriately. Uh, and the last two hormones, LH, FSH, I'm kind of uh, gonna sort of group them together. They basically as part of the reproductive system and are there to, uh, in the female, for instance, to control the menstrual cycle, the ovarian cycle, the, uh, the changes to the endometrial cavity in preparation for pregnancy. Uh, FSH very specifically also deals with proper maturation of the follicles in the ovaries and proper maturation of the seminiferous tubules in the testes in the male. But overall, essentially, we put them together with testosterone and estrogen that we have learned already about as reproductive system specific hormones. <clears throat> now, um, the next gland we want to look at is still, we're still in the brain, and this is the pineal gland or pineal gland. And this is the uh, gland that's located kind of towards the posterior, towards the, sort of the back of the brain, deep inside. And it's a fairly small structure that releases one hormone called melatonin. This is the hormone essential for regulation of the sleep cycle. Uh, and basically the best way to think about this is that melatonin is secreted in the greatest concentration just around the time that you need to be going to bed. And so it responds to kind of sunlight conditions once it gets dark outside and your eyes kind of notice that it's getting dark, instead of kind of getting ready to go to sleep, more melatonin is secreted in the brain and acts on different brain areas to activate sleep state and basically help you go, go to sleep, help you rest. And then early in the morning, as you're trying to, trying to wake up, melatonin concentrations are decreasing and <clears throat> allow you to kind of activate that arousal state and uh, help you wake up. Again, the hormone is melatonin coming from the pineal gland in the brain. Now, now we're finally kind of out of the uh, brain area, so we can go to the trachea area, right? Anterior neck, we have the thyroid. The thyroid, remember, is located at the thyroid cartilage, which is the anterior wall of the larynx of the voice box. So on the outside, I have this butterfly shaped organ called the thyroid. Uh, the thyroid has two sets of cells in them. One is cells related to the thyroid follicles, another is what's called C cells or parafollicular cells. The thyroid follicles release multiple hormones. The primary ones are thyroxine or T4 and T3, which is triiodothyronine. Both of these hormones need iodine uh, to function and to be synthesized. Uh, the way to think about the thyroid follicles is that once these hormones are produced, they are like the growth hormone, affect all functions, uh, essentially go to every cell, so the target tissue, especially every cell in the body, and also basically support normal function of the cells, normal cell functions, making sure that all the right proteins and other molecules are produced, make sure the cells are in their proper balance and homeostasis. And so it's absolutely critical for the thyroid gland to be normally functioning, all these hormones to be produced. Um, they, again, thyroid hormones essential for metabolic controls of all cells, for normal cardiovascular function, normal functioning of the digestive system, of the skin, 
pretty much any organ you can think of the thyroid hormones play at least some part in their normal state of functioning and normal healthy uh, state of those organs <clears throat> For, T, uh, for the, the next cell, uh, set of cells here, the C cells, uh, they release a very different type of hormone called calcitonin. And this is gonna be one of two hormones we're gonna learn about that deal with control of calcium levels in the body or calcium homeostasis. And in case of calcitonin, this one will be released when you have excessive amounts of calcium in your blood, something we call hypercalcemia. So if the person has elevated levels of calcium in the blood, which potentially would be dangerous because this could dis disturb normal cell functions, function of the muscle or the nervous system. We need to bring down those levels and calcitonin basically is released and allowing so more of that calcium to be either excreted by the body or put back into the bone or essentially removed in other ways. Again, calcitonin responds to hypercalcemia in the blood. Now, uh, just before we go to this side for the rest of the primary uh, endocrine structures, let's just talk about the secondary organs. These are regular organs we have already learned about. Uh, and essentially keep in mind that sometimes uh, even a regular organ that normally isn't associated with endocrine structure can actually produce hormones, can have this endocrine effect. And there are many examples. The two ones that I outlined here is the adipose tissue and the stomach. So when you're thinking of the fat reserves in your body, the fat isn't just there silently sitting there accumulating kind of energy, it's actually is endocrine active organ and releases at least one hormone that we know of is what's called leptin and leptin uh, inhibits hunger as part of appetite control in the body. Uh, and the control of appetite deal has to do with the control of the through the hypothalamus and other regions in the brain, but in the peripheral part of the body, adipose tissue with this hormone plays a role in regulating the appetite uh, for, uh, for normal function of the body. And for the stomach, uh, we also have at least one hormone that we are familiar with. And this is gastrin, for instance, this is the hormone that's released by the stomach in order to activate other stomach cells that in this case specifically they're activating cells that produce hydrochloric acid uh, as part of the normal gastric acid production that we're all familiar with. So the acid, again, is not produced by itself whenever it feels like, it's actually produced when gastrin is released first, and then that tells the other cells, the acid producing cells in the stomach to start working and doing their job. Now, for the rest of the uh, primary endocrine glands, uh, we have the parathyroid, we have the thymus, adrenal gland, and the pancreas. So the parathyroid is this interesting four separate little button-like structures behind the thyroid, okay? And so they release one hormone called the PTH or parathyroid hormone. And this hormone should be primarily thought of as uh, the antagonist of calcitonin. Okay, so if calcitonin was there, to decrease calcium levels in the blood because a person had hypercalcemia, PTH will be released when a person doesn't have enough calcium in the blood, when they have hypocalcemia. So hypocalcemia is a state that again, is, could be very damaging to muscle cells, nervous system and others, as we need perfect kind of very narrow range of calcium levels in the blood to have normal cell function. And so, when PTH is released, again, only in response to hypocalcemia or low calcium levels, uh, the PTH will try to do everything possible to get that calcium level reinstated. One will be to increase calcium absorption in the digestive tract uh, and do other things to basically maintain normal calcium homeostasis, right? Again, here, calcium is portrayed as Ca2+, as the ionized form of calcium <coughs> or electrolyte of calcium. And obviously when it's stored in the bones, calcium is not stored as an electrolyte, it's stored as calcium hydroxyapatite, uh, but just uh, when it's traveling through the blood and through other ways, right, it's often could be portrayed as just an ion of calcium. Again, both calcitonin and PTH are there to regulate calcium homeostasis in the body. 
Now for the thymus hormone uh, or the thymus gland, sorry, uh, thymosin is the hormone that's uh, primarily responsible for maintaining normal thymus structure to stimulate the T-cell development, allow T-cells to go to the thymus where the T-cells obtain their knowledge about the antigens throughout the body and learn to act as proper T-cells, like kind of like a school for T-cells. That's the job of the thymus. Remember, thymus is located underneath the sternum in a child and then involutes or kind of disappears uh, later in life during like the early 20s because by that time your immune system is fully functioning and you have uh, basically normal immune system and the T-cells have learned already what to do and they're mature. Uh, now for the last two glands, uh, you have the adrenal gland and the pancreas. So adrenal, actually again, fairly small structures on top of the kidneys in this kind of triangular form. The adrenal cortex and adrenal medulla do completely different things. So the cortex is the outer portion in that triangle and the medulla is the deeper portion. The adrenal cortex produces at least two hormones. One is called aldosterone, another is called cortisol. Aldosterone is there to regulate fluid and electrolyte balance in the body. So again, uh, helps the kidneys and other organs to regulate electrolytes like sodium ions, potassium ions, and others, and fluid balance in the body. And cortisol is a hormone that even has much more dramatic effects. This is a hormone that we know as a stress response hormone. Uh, it has dramatic effects on the immune system, suppressing the immune system. Uh, Cortisol is produced uh, in what's called a diurnal pattern, meaning the highest concentration of cortisol is released early in the morning when you wake up. It's sort of like a seize the day uh, hormone, uh, giving you that boost of energy. And then its lowest concentration in the blood of cortisol is late at night when you're going to sleep. So cortisol there helps your body prepare for normal functions of daily life, helps you deal with stress, helps you deal with metabolism of glucose, and carbohydrates in general, and overall supports, again, normal function of the body, similar to the way that the growth hormone and the thyroid hormone have done, especially the thyroid hormone. Okay, so again, cortisol, stress response hormone coming from the adrenal cortex. And when we look at the adrenal medulla, which is the deeper kind of inner portion as medulla always like this called in an organ. So adrenal medulla actually deals with the sympathetic nervous system uh, and produces two hormones, adrenaline and norepinephrine. So epinephrine, which is adrenaline and norepinephrine are two major neurotransmitters uh, that are found throughout the body, including the brain, and in this case act as hormones. Uh, basically they are there for the fight or flight response, uh, which is, we're gonna learn about that later in the semester. It essentially helps your body uh, deal with stressful situations and allows us to bring more blood supply to those organs that are needed during that very specific moment of stress, like to the blood, to the muscles, and less blood supply to like digestive system, uh, where in this case digestive function would be not prioritized, and uh, airways will need to be opened up and more blood need to go to the heart and other uh, tissues like muscles to allow them to function properly. Again, we'll talk about this more when we talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system in a different chapter in the book. And for the last uh, structure here, the pancreas, right? we already talked about the pancreas. Pancreas has uh, alpha cells and beta cells, right? These are uh, islet cells that we call them, hormone producing cells as part of the endocrine pancreas component. So two main hormones produced there, right? So the beta cells produce insulin, the alpha cells produce glucagon. Insulin is there is essentially to correct uh, or deal with hyperglycemia. So most insulin would be produced after a meal, after a person has gotten food into the digestive system and is going into the bloodstream. In order for the glucose molecules and carbohydrates to enter our cells, insulin must be present at that time to allow glucose molecules to enter, okay? Those people who have diabetes where insulin isn't being produced properly in case of type one diabetes or type two diabetes where insulin is produced but the body is resistant to insulin 
or the cellular, on the cellular level, uh, the tissues are resistant. Again, results in the same effect where not enough cells are obtaining their energy sources and it damages them, especially blood vessels, especially kidneys and other organs. Uh, and so this is why diabetes is such a serious condition uh, that's unfortunately is very common. And so again, insulin, very important organ, probably one of the most important hormones we have here. Uh, again, there to correct hyperglycemia, right? So when the glucose levels are high in the blood, insulin comes in to let the glucose diminish because it's not gonna be entering into the cells of the body. Okay, the only organ in the body that in generally does not need insulin to be present in order to uptake glucose, that's the brain, the central nervous system. For glucagon, we have a sort of an opposite effect. Glucagon is released uh, during a state of um, either starvation or when the person has not has been fasting or hasn't had a meal in a long time. Remember, the body still needs glucose to survive, right? So in the liver, we have glycogen, uh, which is a long form of glucose, right? That's a polymer, and glucagon will be released from the pancreas, go to uh, the liver and tell the liver to release some of that glucose from the glycogen molecule so they could be so glucose can go to feed all the, the cells, basically. Um, even though, again, right at that moment, the person is not eating, is not ingesting any carbohydrates, but we have storage of carbohydrates in the liver, so the glucagon is helping there to take some of those uh, stored glucose and make it usable. Again, as with all the lectures, make sure you're looking at the notes on Blackboard and reading the chapter unit 16 in our lab manual and uh, following all the notes uh, with the videos and the lectures.